The next item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion No. 5930 in the name of John Pentland on Workers' Memorial Day 2013. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask people who are leaving the gallery to please do so quietly as the Parliament is still in session? Thank you very much. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible? And I call on John Pentland to open the debate. Mr Pentland, seven minutes, please. President Officer, I want to start by thanking everybody who is attending and participating or signed the motion, everyone who contributed to the shoes exhibition, and to the many others who have gone out of their way to support me, the Hazards Campaign, Families Against Corporate Colours, the STUC, and the GMB and Community Trade Unions, for this, my first member's debate, International Workers' Memorial Day. And I also welcome Bill Kidd's amendment and his sponsorship of the Hazards Exhibition. President Officer, I was very moved to read the poem Empty Shoes by health and safety campaigner Wendy Lawrence. No more footsteps on the path as you come home. I just sit here with my grief so all alone. No key is turned by you in our front door. No sound of walking to me across our floor. I've cried so much. My eyes are red and sore. Empty shoes. No more you, just empty shoes. That poem was written by Wendy after reading about yet another avoidable death caused by work. And this is what spurred me to organise the exhibit which is in display in the public lobby from today until next week's debate on blacklisting. Many of those blacklisted had simply raised health and safety concerns. Now, we all know that statistics don't have the same emotional power as poetry to describe the depth and grief suffered by the families and friends of victims, but unfortunately they do show the enormity of the issue. Globally, the ILO estimates that one worker dies every 15 seconds. Over 2.3 million deaths a year are due to occupational accidents or diseases where 160 million workers suffer work-related illnesses and over 300 million people are injured in workplace accidents. For the economists, that adds up to 4% of global GDP lost at a cost of a trillion pounds. In the UK, workers' deaths were 173 last year, down from double that figure 20 years ago. These figures, however, do not include members of the public killed and injured in workplaces. Non-fatal accidents at work have also fallen considerably over the last 10 years, from about a million to 600,000. As well as deaths at work, UK government figures show at least 20,000 die from work-related injuries and illnesses, such as occupational cancers, cancers COPD, cardiovascular disorders and road traffic accidents. Estimates for underreporting suggest the real figure may be as high as 50,000. In Scotland, while workplace-related illness and injury dropped, fatalities rose to 20, and not for the first time the Scottish rate is higher than the UK. Now, this may be because construction and agriculture are larger parts of our economy and, higher, and have higher accident rates. Agriculture, in particular, accounts for two-thirds of deaths. However, neither explanations nor the fallen trends are cause for complacency. Any death is one too many. So, colleagues, if we can help address the Scottish situation by devolving health and safety to the Scottish Government, then I, for one, believe that's what we should do. Historically, though, health and safety improvements have not come from the above. Workers in industries such as steel had to contend with poor safety regimes and fought through their unions to get improvements. Now, given my background in the steel industry and its central role in my constituency, I am well aware 
of the steelworkers' struggle. So I look forward to the creation of a steelworkers' memorial at Ravensgrave to mark the health, to mark the lives and health lost as a result of the steel industry. And my best wishes go to North Lanarkshire Trade Union Council for their event at 12 o'clock on Sunday in Summerlee Industrial Museum and to the dozen or more other events throughout Scotland. Now, alongside remembering the dead, we must still fight for the living. In the UK, despite their own figures suggesting low-risk workplaces account for over half of workplace deaths, the government has withdrawn unannounced health and safety inspections, and workers are still pressured to meet unattainable targets by employers, and the upshot can be safety standards ignored. So let us thank our union safety reps for the crucial work that they undertake, often in difficult circumstances, to resist such pressures. And finally, let us also remember that this is International Workers' Day. As the disaster in Bangladesh reminds us, there is still much more that we can do. We should oppose cheap good being produced at the cost of people's lives and well-being and insist on preventative action by multinationals, not just for lip service after the event. So that, colleagues, is why we need International Workers' Memorial Day. And in the closing words of Empty Shoes, to honour your great sacrifice, I hope your work makes unionise. And to do it soon before another dies, in remembrance of you, no more Empty Shoes. Thank you. To allow me to call all the members who have indicated they would like to contribute, if we could have speeches of less than four minutes, I call Drew Smith to be followed by Bill Kidd. Thank you, President Officer. I draw your attention to my entry in the Register of Members' Interests, and I also thank you for your latitude in calling me in this debate and apologise to other members that I will have to leave before the end in order to meet representatives of the Construction Workers Union UCAP. Um, speaking in this place is always a privilege, but on occasions such as this, it is also an honour. So can I add my thanks to my colleague John Pentland for bringing forward this motion for debate and for ensuring that members of the Scottish Parliament have the opportunity of honouring those workers across this country and across the world who have had their lives taken away from them over the course of this last year and in the further past. Um, I want to add my voice in support of all of those families who have witnessed their loved ones leave for work in the morning but looked in vain to welcome them home again. On the occasion of International Workers' Memorial Day, we also recognise all of those workers who have been injured at work or who have been left with debilitating or limiting conditions. Um, like many members, I will be marking the day by uh, laying a wreath at my uh, own local event at the People's Palace in Glasgow. And I would encourage all members uh, to look out for the events taking place in their area this weekend. Workers' Memorial Day is, of course, a campaigning opportunity as well as a time of solemn remembrance, but physical memorials are important. In the next couple of weeks, Glasgow will mark the unveiling of the Firefighters Heritage Trail, which will include 12 memorial sto stones placed to mark the sites such as, as Cheapside, uh, Cheapside Street Fire, uh, where 19 firefighters were lost in 1960, and James Watt Street, also in Anderson, where 22 workers, mostly women, were lost when an upholstery warehouse caught fire uh, in 1968. And as someone who lives very close to the memorial stones, which stand in remembrance of the victims of the 2004 explosion, at ICL Plastics in Maryhill are reminded of that tragedy in which nine workers were killed almost every day. I mentioned that Workers' Memorial Day falling as it does just before the Workers' Gala Day May Day is a chance to remember but also a focal, focal point for campaigning and activism. So can I pay tribute to, to everyone across Scotland, across the world who is involved in the struggle to ensure that the imbalance, imbalance that exists in every workplace between the employers and the employed the world over is tilted a tiny bit back, not ever in favour of working people, but just slightly less against them. Hundreds of people die in the UK every year, and the figures vary depending on whether we take into account accident injuries or um, conditions resulting from work. And John Pentland was quite right to highlight blacklisting uh, and that scandal. Many of those uh, affected by that scandal will be workers who have raised health and safety concerns. And at the same time, the coalition government is rolling back not just the years, but the centuries on workers' rights 
and health and safety enf enforcement. And I have to say, President Officer, it's disappointing uh, to see uh, no members of the coalition parties represented in this debate. At a recent hearing on health and safety held by the Health and Sport Committee, of which I am a member, we, we did hear that here in Scotland our, our rates of death and injury remain higher than in other parts of the United Kingdom. Um, and John Pentland correctly identified this. For me, the issue of uh, which powers this Parliament could assume to assist that situation, if that was considered the way um, to try and drive that figure down, would be around how we use enforcement powers so that we avoid um, a legislative situation where we create a race to the bottom on regulation. Um, can I ask President Officer simply um, by encouraging members to go and speak to the representatives of the Scottish Hazards Campaign and Families Against Corporate Killing in Parliament today, ask them about Cameron, the 16-year-old who weeks into his first job was killed in an accident involving an industrial lathe, or the 17-year-old Stephen who was killed by a 30-foot fall at work in a water treatment plant, an 18-year-old Lewis, Lewis killed after being burnt in a garage fire. Can I simply add my voice, presiding officer, to call on us all to remember the dead and fight for the living? Thank you very much. I now call Bill Kidd to be followed by Neil Finlay. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I congratulate John Pentland on uh, securing this very important member's business and uh, can also thank John for his kind efforts to help with uh, potentially moving this debate um, to aid the SNP's group's tribute meeting to our colleague Brian Adam, which happily we did not have to do. But uh, John uh, put out a great effort on that and it is much appreciated as indeed is the gift of this Purple Memorial Ribbon, uh, which makes our support um, for International Workers' Memorial Day uh, shown uh, to the world. And I would like, if I may, uh, to put on record our friend uh, Brian Adams' dedication to ensuring that workers in the rigs and vessels serving the oil and gas industry in the North Sea were represented whenever health and safety issues were raised. And to note that as a long-time trade union activist himself, he knew the value and necessity of the work of unions and Scottish hazards in keeping this issue to the fore. Uh, presiding officer, on the 2nd of December 1984, the Bhopal gas disaster at the Union Carbide site in India killed thousands of people, and it still has an effect on the lives of many hundred, hundreds more in that area who are still having to campaign uh, for redress for what took place in that disgraceful episode when uh, business was more important than workers. Uh, yet, the governments of both India and the USA have been shown to have collaborated in allowing Dow Chemicals, who now own Union Carbide, to escape facing up to the liabilities that have affected individuals and the whole community of Bhopal. And yet, a full 29 years later, a recent explosion at Texas fertiliser plant, which we all heard about recently, we are still seeing a failure on an international scale to address safety issues. Because it was actually in 1985, just after the Bhopal disaster, that the Texas factory was last inspected by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration of the United States. That's a full 28 years without a health and safety inspection. A result of this failing, 14 people died and almost 200 were injured. So what is the UK government's reaction to these lessons? Well, it's a cut of 35% in the health and safety executive's budget and an announcement of an end to proactive announced visits by the, unannounced visits by the health and safety executive to factories and other industrial sites. This is un un utterly unacceptable slap in the face to all workers in the industries affected by the slapdash charge to increase profits at the risk of workers' lives and limb. For the past three years, the Scottish Government has ordered the flying of flags on public buildings to be at half-mast as a sign of respect for those killed at work. Meanwhile, the Minister in Westminster, Chris Grayling, is failing in his duty to show respect to the living. Therefore, I would like to encourage everyone to stop by, as, uh, as Drew has said, stop by the Scottish Hazards and Families Against Corporate Killing exhibit which I am sponsoring this week outside the members' block. I and those staffing the stall are delighted by the response so far, but let's all have a final push to give all the support we can, please, to show our support for International Workers' Memorial Day. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Neil Finlay to be followed <coughs> by Hugh Henry. Uh, thanks, President Officer. Colleagues, International Workers' Memorial Day originated in Canada in 1985 and was introduced to the UK by a 
Hazards campaigner Tommy Hart. And in my own area, my former council colleague and past trade union convener at British Leyland, Jimmy Swan, uh, brought it to our county. And can I, at this point, congratulate John Pentland for uh, bringing it to the chamber today. As we've heard, the motto of the uh, event is mourn the dead and fight for the living. And, and too tragically, every year we still have to mourn the dead, as internationally a staggering two million of our fellow global citizens die at or as a result of their work. And each year, families are left without fathers or mothers. And tragically, and this is particularly relevant where child labour is present, mothers and fathers left without sons or daughters. Across the world, each year, more than two million men and women die as a result of work-related accidents and diseases. Uh, workers suffer approximately 270 million accidents each year and fall victim to 160 million incidents of related illnesses. We see hazard substances kill 440,000 workers annually and asbestos still claiming 100,000 lives. As somebody mentioned previously, a, a worker dying every 15 seconds, 6,000 workers a day. More people dying at work than in war. And these are truly appalling and shocking statistics. In the UK, the TUC estimate over 20,000 people die prematurely every year as a result of injuries or accidents caused by their work. More than 2 million people suffering some form of occupational ill health. And all this at a time when, according to the Trade Union Prospect, there are now only three occupational uh, health physicians left at the HSE, 18 occupational health inspectors, down from 60 of each in the early 90s. And all over, the HSE has lost hundreds of staff and, as Bill Kidd mentioned, proactive investigations cut dramatically. And these HSE cuts are built on nothing more than myth and dogma. Health and safety seen by right-wing politicians, think tanks and the free market disciples is a burden on business that has to be slain. David Cameron has vowed to do something about, and I quote, the health and safety monster. Well, they are doing something about it. They're actively and rapidly destroying the health and safety executive, and they're making their building sites, factories, chemical works, and other places less safe and more dangerous. And make no mistake about it, people will die because of this. People will suffer injury and disease. But, of course, that is another price workers have to pay for dogma. And I'm actually very pleased that none of the uh, UK coalition parties are present today because I don't think I could stomach it in this debate. In the last year, I've followed proceedings uh, of the Scottish Affairs Select Committee, Committee at Westminster and their investigation into construction industry blacklisting, and I've campaigned on, it, on this issue in Parliament. The investigation came directly as a result of concerns about Scotland's poor health and safety record when compared to the rest of the UK. And it transpired during their inquiry that the reason trade unions believed these figures were worse was because health and safety reps had systematically been denied, and drummed out, denied employment and drummed out the Scottish construction industry. This is a scandal, and I won't dwell too much on it today, as I will cover it in my members' debate next week. But in this brief debate today, President Officer, I would say that no family should experience the loss of a loved one simply for going to work. And on Sunday, a number of us, I'm sure, will join many mourning the dead. But the day after, we must continue the fight for the living. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Hugh Hendry to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. There's hardly a community in Scotland that hasn't been affected by death caused at work over the years. And not just the deaths that happen in the workplace. As John Pentland so eloquently said, it's the, 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 the disease and the illness which is also caused that can blight lives. And I want to thank John Pentland for bringing this debate to, to the Parliament today, because it's actually very timely, given the incident in Bangladesh and the reminder uh, about wor what workers have to suffer uh, in many parts of the world. But coming back to the Scottish dimension for a moment, over the generations, as John Pentland has said, steel workers have suffered, have died, and their health has been blighted. Coal miners in many communities in Scotland suffered greatly uh, because of the conditions in their workplace. But it's not just the industrial legacy that we have. Over the years, many agricultural workers in rural areas in Scotland suffered because of carelessness, thoughtlessness, and frankly, disregard for their well-being. But this isn't, unfortunately, 
an historical issue for us in Scotland or indeed within the United Kingdom. Because as Bill Kidd and Neil Finlay and others have said, the fact that the cuts in the health and safety executive are happening frankly shows a blatant disregard for the well-being of people who are doing nothing but simply trying to do an honest day's work. And we can look in all of our communities, even at events in the last few years, but things like, um, and it's sometimes death and sometimes injury, uh, Wanda Lustig, a, a Polish worker who was injured while working for the Dunblane uh, Farming Company, uh, whose life has been ruined um, because of the injury at work and her employer has now been fined. But there are also tragic deaths. You know, Patricia Ferguson, no doubt, will talk about uh, the Stockline disaster, which affected families in my own area in, in, in Renfrewshire. Or, as the, the, the news this week reported, the prosecutions uh, in relation to the capsizing of the, the Flying Phantom uh, tugboat, which affected um, a family in Houston, in Renfrewshire, part of my constituency, as well as other families in Greenock and Gourock. And every one of these events shows carelessness and shows disregard for workers because they, in a sense, were an afterthought. And it's a disgrace, and I'm pleased that my colleague Neil Finlay has been doing so much work in relation to blacklisting, but it's, dis it's a disgrace that when workers attempt to protect themselves and their fellow workers, then they are blacklisted as a result of those activities for doing nothing other than saying our health and our safety should be paramount when we are doing our day's work. And the fact that these blacklists existed in secrecy and families were denied the opportunity to have a, a, an income coming into the house for doing something that most of us would think was the decent thing to do and the right thing to do. But I don't think as a socialist and a trade unionist that my responsibilities simply stop at my community, my workplace, Scotland or indeed the United Kingdom. Because the tragedy in Bangladesh shows that my family and other families in Scotland have benefited in the back of the turmoil and tragedy of the way that these workers have been producing cheap clothing. The fact that Bhopal is still an issue and will be an issue for many years is a disgrace. The fact that we see workers in many countries having to scramble about waste sites in order to try to earn a, a day's living with no, with no regard for their health shows that there still remains a problem. So our duty is to workers in Scotland, Britain and internationally. We need to stand by them and it's a disgrace that profits still matter more than lives. <laughs> Thank you. If I'm going to call, if I'm going to get everyone in, I really need the people to keep it under four minutes. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Patricia Ferguson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, on a very sad day for this Parliament. Uh, I too congratulate uh, John Pentland uh, for securing this members' debate and uh, commend him for actually raising the issue today. And I've got absolutely no hesitation about wearing the ribbon uh, as well. Um, as we've heard, uh, Workers Memorial Day was, uh, was created in Canada in the 1980s. Uh, and it is now an international day of remembrance for workers killed in incidents at work or by diseases caused by work. Now, the need for Workers Memorial Day is revealed in the figures from the ILO, which, uh, as we have heard, it kills uh, more than 2 million women and men die uh, on an annual basis as a, as a result of work-related accidents and diseases. And one worker dies every 15 seconds worldwide. Uh, 6,000 workers die every single day. Uh, more people die whilst being at work as compared to those fighting wars. Also, hazardous substances kill 440,000 workers annually, with asbestos alone claiming 100,000 lives. And uh, I do want to refer the members to my register of interest as an honorary member of Clydeside Action on Asbestos. However, the purpose of this day is twofold. It is to remember those who have died uh, or who have been injured or made ill at their work, but also it aims to ensure that the loss and the suffering is used to re reinvigorate the campaign for healthier and safer work for those still at work, their families and their children who will become tomorrow's workers. The latest figures for Scotland highlighted that 20 people in Scotland die at their work, but there is also the problem of people contracting illnesses from their work which do not emerge until years later. And the prime example of this uh, are asbestos-related diseases such as mesothelioma, which can develop 20, 30, even 40 years after 
the initial exposure to asbestos. And that's why I wear the badge of Clyster Action on Asbestos uh, as well. According to figures from the Health and Safety Executive, more than 2,000 people per year in the UK are diagnosed with mesothelioma. Uh, there are also at least a further 2,000 cases of lung cancer, which uh, are also likely to be caused by asbestos exposure. The numbers of those diagnosed with fatal conditions are set to rise in the future, and it is estimated that 1.5 million workplace premises will still contain asbestos. Now, this Parliament has a good track record in supporting people with asbestos-related diseases, such as the legislation to overturn the disgraceful House of Laws decision in 2007, blocking those of plural plaques seeking compensation from negligent employers, a position that successive Westminster governments have failed to take. So it is appropriate that in debating Workers' Memorial Day, we also remember those who contracted asbestos-related diseases through the negligence of their employers. This is an issue that has scarred many communities across Scotland, and not just the former industrial heartlands of the west of Scotland. Asbestos diseases are still with us and will remain so for a number of years. And it is important that events like Workers' Memorial Day can be used to reiterate the need for greater health and safety in the workplace. There is also an issue with the need for health and safety legislation to be applied as quickly as possible. And members will be aware of the, the, the news of this week regarding the case of the Flying Phantom, the tug which sank in the Clyde in December 2007 with the loss of three lives. This was obviously a tragedy for all concerned. Three people lost their lives and their families have been left devastated ever since. Yet it wasn't until Monday, over five years later, that there was the announcement that the companies involved will face prosecution under the Health and Safety at Work Act. Now, I know that the Crown Office has spent some considerable amount of time investigating the Flying Phantom tragedy, but these families have had to wait a long time to see this case brought forward. Too many families suffer the horror of seeing a loved one go to work and never return. And it's important that health and safety legislation at work is tackled seriously. Health and safety in the workplace isn't an optional extra. It is a fundamental right for all workers. Now, the motto of International Workers' Memorial Day is to remember the dead and fight for the living. And this debate has, uh, certainly has, uh, has managed to do that. Now, uh, I'm conscious, President Officer, that uh, certainly going forward, this Parliament needs to have the powers to actually make sure that, uh, that we actually can do something We're realistic to as compared to uh, what, uh, what has been the case at Westminster. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I call Patricia Ferguson, can I say of two further members who I would like to call, but I can only give them three minutes each. Patricia Ferguson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I congratulate John Pentland on securing this debate on such an important issue and also for his very comprehensive explanation of the issues and the campaign. The workers are safe at work should, of course, be a fundamental right, and workers and their families should expect no less. My colleagues will know, and I will make no apology for speaking about it again, of the dreadful tragedy that took place in my then constituency almost nine years ago but which for the families connected to the Stockline factory has repercussions to this day. At Stockline, the simple act of flicking a switch to put on a light created a spark which ignited combustible gases leaking from a pipe that was buried underground and therefore incapable of inspection. An entirely avoidable accident. And I am able to summarise quickly for the Chamber the cause of the disaster at Stockline. But it took se several years before the families bereaved in that disaster knew the truth of the story. In fact, it took over three years for the criminal prosecution to begin, a criminal prosecution that resulted, in my view, in a paltry fine of £200,000. And it was a further year before the public inquiry began now, of course, we know that the Stockline situation is not unique and that other families have also been bereaved because of workplace accidents. And as Stuart McMillan rightly says, often wait a long time before inquiries can help them to begin to understand what happened to their family members. Presiding officer, what Stockline told me is that health and safety legislation can help to prevent accidents and must be our priority. And if devolving it to the Scottish Parliament, as John Pentland suggested, is a way of making sure that our disproportionate, uh, disproportionately bad record in health and safety can be uh, ameliorated, then I would also support that. But we also know that where accidents happen, we have to find a way to make sure that the families are dealt with uh, in a very courteous and sensitive way and that their concerns are brought forward at a much earlier stage. 
And that is why I am proposing a Member's Bill on Fatal Accident Inquiries, which will give families the right to be heard when decisions as to whether or not a fatal accident inquiry is to take place. And it's also suggesting that, where possible, that the inquiry can run concurrently with a criminal case, and also that the Sheriff can make recommendations which will be binding. Presiding officer, these measures would help to demonstrate that we do remember the dead and that we honour them, but that we also fight for the living. And I very much hope that colleagues will support these measures when I bring them forward in the very near future. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call a Sarah Boyer to be followed by Helen Eady. Three minutes each, please. Thank you very much, presiding officer. I too want to thank uh, John Pentland for ensuring we have this debate today. I also want to thank the Families Against Corporate Killing and the thousands of trade union representatives for the hard work that they do to keep the issue of safety at work on our agenda and on employers' agendas too. Health and safety is not a burden on in industry. It's about a good health and safety regime that's a sign of company values. It's something to be proud of. And it's not just protection for workers and companies and public sector organisations. As others have said, when something goes wrong, it can impact on neighbouring communities. Lives can be put at risk and we can see detrimental impact on the local environment. And the Legionnaires outbreak in Edinburgh saw local communities hit and lives lost. But due to council cutbacks by the previous council leadership, I am told that vital time was lost in getting the investigation going and that cuts and pressures on the health and safety executive also had an impact. And we need to learn the lessons of that experience because we need expertise across the country. It needs to be capable of instant mobilisation as soon as incidents occur. And it's vital that evidence is not lost and that accountability and lessons can be learned. Again, close to home in Edinburgh, we still don't have transparency on what happened on the fateful night when firefighter Ewan Williamson lost his life fighting the fire in the Balmoral Bar. It was nearly four years ago. And while I welcome the fact that the Crown Office has now instituted legal proceedings, his family and his FBU colleagues are still waiting for a proper inquiry to establish the facts, to learn lessons and to make sure that FBU members who put their lives on the line for us every day are supported by knowing what happened. And yesterday, a new report by the Inspectorate of Prosecution in Scotland raised important concerns. They praised the high standards, the work of the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal Service Health and Safety Division, but they express worries about the length of time it takes to conclude cases. They say we need more accountability and we need action. I think that we need to look at the issue of staff turnover. Increasingly, it's a concern across the public sector in Scotland, with valuable expertise and knowledge lost. I hope the Minister will comment there's something the Scottish Government could do now. They could look at Patricia Ferguson's members' bills to make sure that we speed up the process of FAIs and to make sure that we get vital lessons learned, that we don't have to wait years before there's accountability. And there's the forthcoming procurement bill, an opportunity to make sure that the health and safety track record of companies will be part of the procurement process. On Sunday, we'll be commemorating International Workers' Memorial Day. And as citizens, we all need to take a stand. We need to demand our governments, our companies and our public sector organisations do all that they can to promote effective health and safety regimes. But as others have said, yesterday's tragic deaths in Dhaka show that we all need to be asking, as citizens and as consumers, that our companies have a duty of care to their employers, not just in Scotland or the UK, but across the globe. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, Helen Eady. Thank you, Presiding Officer, for making time uh, for us. Um, can I pay tribute to John Pentland uh, for bringing this debate and also to all those other members, parliamentarians in this chamber and elsewhere, who prioritise their work commitments as politicians to give priority to uh, this vitally important aspect of all our lives. Because I can remember uh, 50 years ago this month um, is when I joined the GMB and I joined the Labour Party at the same time. And one of the things that influenced me at that time was reading a publication that I found on my father's bookshelf. And it was a publication about the Match Girls' strike. 
uh, about the fussy jaw that um, was experienced by those women all those years ago and how they fought by forming the <coughs> Women's uh, General Union to campaign for their protection. And I thought that was something that was aspirational and inspirational for, for me as well and has uh, been something that I liked the idea that <coughs> other people would fight for my rights and I would help to fight for other people's rights. And that is a lasting um, feeling that I have today and is one of the reasons that I carry on uh, with this very important uh, work that we all do. And I think it's a major credit to the trade unions across the world uh, that they have fought so hard to ensure that the legislation has been put in place to protect workers. I think that's just critical. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't have the legislation today. They have also provided legal assistance, which has ensured compensation and established case law to support those affected by industrial injury and disease and have had landmark uh, cases like those fighting for asbestosis uh, victims pneumoconiosis and all the other uh, diseases and injuries uh, that happen. Indeed, my father, um, when he was working in car and ironworks, I can remember uh, his finger being chopped off. And I mean, that was not a disaster for the community, but it was a disaster for the Miller family at that time because mum had to go out to work because there was no sick pay, there was no financial support at all for my father. It's a very long time ago uh, now, but it was a disaster for the family at the time. And let us remember, too, um, those affected by people like the Piper Alpha disaster, one of the worst disasters in the North Sea, when so many lost their lives. Let us remember, too, those who worked so hard to support the survivors of those families, as indeed happened right across the world. People have to pick up the pieces. I had families in Dogetty Bay affected by that awful disaster. I know the lasting impact that a disaster like that has on the union officials, the, the lawyers, the uh, medical teams, and all those family and friends who are left to cope. And the union officials representing, representing some of the members and their families, I know the lasting impact it had uh, on my husband, for he was one of the union officials. And to this day, uh, the tears will well up in his eyes when, and it's many years ago now since the Piper uh, Alpha disaster. So we have to remember that it's, there are many, many people affected by disasters. And finally, um, presiding officer, for I'm grateful to you for giving uh, time. Uh, my role as a former GMB full-time official meant that I represented many members in schools and colleges. But worryingly, uh, there was the thing that I found that there was a very huge number of home workers who were as vulnerable to exploitation and have uh, been uh, very um, much victims, really nice uh, particularly in the garment industry. And I'll just fin conclude by saying I remember all those in the coal mining communities like the Donny Bristol disaster, the Valleyfield disaster and the Michael disaster. And we do well to pay tribute and remember them uh, each year. And I hope that it will become bigger remembrance across Scotland. Thank you, President. <laughs> Thank you. I now call on Michael Matheson to respond to the debate. Seven minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. Can I, like others, uh, uh, join in congratulating John Pentland and Security Time for uh, this important day, a, a debate about what is a, a significant day, which I uh, hope will become uh, increasingly embedded within uh, Scottish consciousness. Um, overall, and I think um, uh, there have been many uh, very worthwhile contributions made by members um, here this afternoon. The Scottish Government uh, first formally recognised International uh, Workers' Memorial Day in 2010, uh, when uh, flags uh, in government buildings were lowered. And a number of members have made reference to memorial sites within their own uh, constituencies and the uh, plans for the memorial in the Ravenscraig site. Um, I passed only a few weeks ago the memorial uh, of the, for the stock line uh, disaster as well, uh, which uh, is extremely important in making sure that these tragedies are not forgotten uh, uh, by uh, communities and individuals. And in my own constituency in uh, Falkirk, a new uh, workers' memorial is uh, planned for the High Street, which will make it much more visible and bring it right to the very heart of the community itself, from where the present uh, plaque is located within uh, uh, Falkirk Council's municipal buildings. And that's been led by a tremendous amount of work that's been taken forward by Duncan McCallum, um, who works very uh, diligently on behalf of the NUJ. Uh, uh, 
Although responsibility for workplace health and safety is an issue which is reserved to the UK Government, uh, the Scottish Government uh, is doing what it can within its existing pools to uh, encourage uh, continuous improvement in occupational health and safety. Uh, we recognise the importance of safe, healthy working environments and equally uh, the importance of having partnership working in addressing these issues. Uh, the Scottish Centre for Healthy Work and Life, which is funded by uh, the Scottish Government, uh, provides free confidential advice to uh, employers and also to employees. And the uh, centre has developed a range of partnerships with organisations such as ROSPA on managing occupational road risk, uh, with Scottish Business and Community on training for uh, mentally uh, healthy workplaces, and also with the TUC to train uh, trade union uh, representatives uh, as well. It also runs initiatives in partnership with organisations such as the Scottish Chamber of Commerce and with the FSB uh, here in Scotland in order to reach into uh, those smaller and medium-sized enterprises in looking at what they can do to improve their uh, work environment for their employees. In John Pentland's uh, motion, uh, he is absolutely right to highlight the very significant role uh, played by trade unions in minimising uh, occupational health and safety risks and the uh, incidents that can go with them. And just last week, uh, the First Minister, when he was addressing the STUE TUC conference, uh, stated, and I quote him, uh, uh, trade unions are an important partner uh, for the Scottish Government and we value our relationship with them very highly indeed. Uh, strong trade unions mean strong workplaces and a strong economy. And I believe that the trade union movement can and will continue to play an important and valuable role in Scotland in the years uh, to come. He also uh, stressed that we totally oppose, uh, are opposed to the blacklisting uh, or the compiling of blacklists uh, that uh, some companies have taken forward. And he outlined uh, steps to ensure that blacklisting uh, is not taking place within uh, public contracts in Scotland. And he's also, uh, on behalf of the Scottish Government and its other agencies, uh, invited unions to work with us on developing uh, guidance for uh, public bodies in addressing issues in future procurement uh, processes and in public contracts. Now, members uh, will be aware, and Neil Finlay made reference to this in his contribution, uh, that the Scottish Affairs uh, Committee at Westminster continue to uh, conduct an inquiry into uh, blacklisting, and I'm aware the member has a debate on this issue uh, next week. And uh, we welcome and will continue to uh, uh, work with the Scottish Affairs Committee uh, uh, on the findings of their interim report, uh, which was published uh, last Tuesday. I also uh, share John Pentland's concerns, uh, concerns which have been reflected by other members in their contribution here uh, this afternoon about the UK Government's change to health and safety regulations. Uh, such uh, changes, I believe, run the risk of sending out the wrong signal to less scrupulous employers who may see it, unfortunately, as an opportunity to abrogate their responsibilities towards health and safety of their workforce. Indeed, I wrote to the UK Government on this very issue, uh, cautioning against any moves that could increase uh, risk to workers. And this followed uh, similar correspondence from my predecessor, uh, Shona Robison, who expressed concern about the reduction in the health and safety executive's budget uh, and the reduction in proactive inspections and the, proposal, uh, the proposed introduce, uh, introduction of free uh, fee, for, uh, fee for fault. Um, I remain concerned at the significant cut the UK Government is implementing on the Health and Safety Executive Budget. And this reduction uh, in proactive inspections, I believe, could result in increased risk of injury and death amongst workers. Uh, this Government's view is that now is not the time to put at risk what are hard-won improvements in Scotland's health and safety record. Uh, the latest uh, HSE statistics for 2011-12 for Scotland show what is a, a welcome downward trend in workplace injuries over the last uh, five years. Uh, the prevalence uh, rate of work-related illness has also uh, fallen from 3 to 2.5 per cent. Sadly, 
there has been a, a small increase in fatal injuries at work, which I believe highlight the need to redouble our efforts in this area. We should acknowledge uh, what lies behind these numbers. Uh, 1.7 million workdays are lost due to workplace injury and ill health. In economic costs, it is around £1 billion. But the human cost cannot be calculated. There are still Minister, too many to to tragic stories question. of broken lives, unnecessary suffering and of families who have lost loved ones. International Workers Memorial Day allows us the opportunity to remember those who have lost their lives or their livelihoods because of unsafe workplaces or practices. It also provides us with an opportunity to remember the dead and to fight for the living. Thank you very much, Minister. Now, I thank members for their discipline in keeping this debate to time on this sad day for the Parliament. I now suspend this meeting until 2.30 p.m. <laughs>